I get told pretty much every day, and maybe this is just an academic thing. I'm, I don't really leave the university very often, so you have to bear with me. But I get told pretty much every day, why do you care about this, you know, family and gender stuff? You know, what about Trump? There's kids in cages. Trump, what about? It reminds me of this Onion article I just saw. Um, man can't believe that couple is upset at him for running over their dog because Trump is the real enemy. I mean, look, uh, politics is important. It's really horrible that kids are in cages at the border. Everybody condemns that, right? Nobody's debating that. But family is really, really important. And it doesn't matter who's president or how awful the government is or whether it's a thousand years ago or a thousand years from today, human beings live in families and the basis of our lives are families and the basis of our family is gender. Right, so this is really, really, really important. And, bec and if you don't care about this, you don't take this seriously because someone's telling you that, you know, this political issue or that political issue is more pressing. That's that's a that's not uh, that's not a um, a helpful piece of advice. That person might be sincere, but that person is accidentally or perhaps intentionally misleading you. This is a really, really important question, and the thing that you should care most about in politics is the school board, what your children learn in school. That's the thing you should care. That should be the most important thing you vote for, no matter what. Who voted the school board this year? One person, two people, you. Ooh, I see other people didn't vote. Of course, if you're not actually eligible to vote, then don't do it. I want to encourage you to break the law. Okay, so this is... Uh, we are living in an extremely polarized time. You could say this globally. You could certainly say it for the United States. Uh, the middle ground in politics, the middle ground in society, the middle ground in pretty much everything is just disappearing, and everything is getting sucked toward these two poles. We could call them sort of liberal and conservative pole, right? Um, what I was thinking about this when I was in my... my class with my students a few months ago, there's no, for example, American society has no role model, has no, there's no one person in the United States, no one man or one, no, there's no one male role model that all Americans can agree on. Now, to be clear, I'm not doing some lament for the days gone by when everyone respected some white guy. I'm the last person who wants to have a uh, society that's more racist or xenophobic than the one today. I'm simply observing, I'm simply observing that if you have a society that doesn't have agreed upon male role models, that's, that's indication of real social fragmentation. That is indication of real social fragmentation. In fact, you could look at American society and you could say that there's actually competing male role models and that those competing male role models basically map onto this like conservative and political division. Everybody following me? So this is a bit of a caricature, but I think it's an accurate caricature. You have one role model you could call the traditional man's man. Think Kevin Costner movies. He's got a cup of coffee. He knows what's right and wrong. He plays baseball, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And then there's what you might call the progressive Progressive guy. Uh, he does the dishes. He's like all tough. He does the dishes. Mashallah. Okay, you know, I'm going to retract that comment because I'm actually I'm undermining my own argument. He does the laundry. He, he, he nurses. He attaches one of those things like where you can nurse uh, babies. <laughs> he does the nursing the baby. He's, he doesn't work. He stays at home, right? He's so, he's so um, feminine that he like erases gender lines. He watches Gilmore Girls and cries, things like that. Okay, I won't tell you about my own viewing habits. So this is, these are caricatures, but I think they're actually pretty accurate caricatures. I think if you think about what are the ways that people, what are the type of thing we see on TV that we see in the movies? And this progressive male role model, the progressive male role model actually breaks down the, the the categories of male and female. So it's not, it's not really even a male role model. He's actually a role model of, a, of a, imagining a society in which male and female no longer have any substantial meaning in society. Everybody with me? 
Okay. Now, this sucks in Muslims. Right, so this sucks in Muslims in, in this country are part of the society, Muslims in Britain, Muslims in any Western country are part of these societies. And we get sucked into the same polarization, right? So um, I'm sure you've debated this. Uh, who, who do Muslims support? Who do you root for? The Republicans who are socially conservative, they don't have these crazy progressive ideas. They don't want to come up and tell your kid that your kid can be a, male, a guy one girl and a female the next a, a, a guy one day, the female the next day, right? They have like they believe in family values, they have none of this crazy progressive nonsense. But of course, they think Muslims are a cancer, need to be removed from the country. That's a little bit inconvenient. But or do Muslims go with the progressive liberal view? They love Muslims. I took all these pictures of these coffee shops downtown. Every coffee shop in the DuPont Circle area has, as far as I can tell, has a symbol on the window saying, Muslims welcome and Islamophobia. It has like a picture of them with hijab and then a rainbow flag right above the woman with hijab, right? So they love Muslims. That's excellent. Finally, somebody talk to me. Somebody's going to put me on. Well, everybody talks to me. What can I say? <laughs> what can I say? But the talk to Altaf or Zahra. Uh, but on the other hand, some of their ideas about lifestyle, some of the things that maybe that people are, are trying to push into school uh, curricula are problematic for Muslims. So where do Muslims go? We feel torn between these two poles. Now, for Muslims, it gets even worse. It gets even harder. Because overlaid onto the conservative and liberal or conservative and progressive polarization, you have what I call the keeping it real versus sellout dichotomy. Everybody knows what this is, right? So if you're a Muslim and you keep it real, what does that mean? That means when someone comes up and says, you know, uh, let's think of an example. What's a good example of keeping it real versus, um, uh, let's, let's think of a, a semi-controversial example. Um, so, I'll, I'll think of, let's just put this one out there. Everything is going to be controversial, so it doesn't matter, right? Some, someone's going to get upset. Let's say, our Qadiani Ahmadi is Muslim. If you keep it real, you say, hell no. Right? If you're progressive, you say, or if you're seen as a sellout, you say, oh no, I think anybody who says they're a Muslim is a Muslim, right? And depending, uh, you're, depending where you are, on this spectrum, you will like take pride in wherever you are, right? So the, the person who's keeping it real says, I'm an authentic Muslim. I stick to the deen. I'm not just going with whatever uh, the local, you know, fad, political correct fad is. The person who is on the cell outside would say, um, you, uh, you're just a backward person. Don't you, how can you have these ideas? These are unacceptable, right? So Muslims get torn between this. They're constantly being filled. Am I, what do I do here? If I do this thing, I mean, someone's going to see me as a sellout. If I do this thing, I'm going to be seen as keeping it real, but I'm also going to be criticized for being backward. Right? If I do this thing, I'm going to be seen as a sellout, but I'm also going to be praised for being with it and hip and woke. So we're constantly feeling these things pulling on us. And then if you take that globally, it's even more intense because it's not just keeping it real versus sellout. It's colonizer versus colonized. It's uh, Western, you know, cultural imperialism versus indigenous, Islam, authentic Islamic culture. And almost any item in the news you see is going to trigger something like of, of this in your mind. Right? So some guy in Uganda says something about homosexuality and Muslims feel like, oh, this is like, oh, do I root for this or not? Is this good for me or not as a Muslim? Like the whole world just gets sucked into this uh, polarization of conservative versus liberal, uh, traditionally Islamic versus westernized, or backward versus enlightened. And depending where you are, what your views are, you're going to view the, other, the person on the other side of this polarization as simply not, not understanding it anymore, not understanding Islam anymore, Either because they're too conservative or too liberal. Everybody understand? I don't think I need to explain this too much. The problem here is that Islam is not conservative or liberal in the American sense. So if you take, I would not even say American, in the Western sense, Islam is not conservative or liberal. 
right? It doesn't fit into these categories. So um, Muslims, let, let, let's just use a controversial example, but it's from the Quran. Muslims believe in that it's prohibited for people to engage in same-sex act actions. This is what's called ma'lum min adin badurura, known as axiomatically as part of the religion from the Quran, from the Sunnah of the Prophet, from the Alayhi from the agreement of Muslim jurists. But what's one of the categories in the Quran? One of the categories of the people around the type of men around whom women do not have to cover their hair, do not have to wear hijab. What's one of them? Can anyone tell me? The, who can guess what I'm aiming at? Ghayri ul al irba, which means what? It literally means men who don't have desire for women. So immediately someone says, oh, that's so liberal. That's not liberal, that's Quranic. Right? So the, Quran, the, the Quran is not a liberal document or a conservative document in the American sense. The, the sunnah of the prophet is not a liberal sun, sunnah or a conservative sunnah. It's the sunnah of the prophet of God. So young Muslim, and here I'm talking to young Muslim men, because I see this happen a lot with young Muslim men. And it really, it, it's, it's disastrous. It's disastrous. Young Muslim men, and I feel you guys, okay? You look at the world around you, you say, okay, I got the conservative thing, I got the liberal thing. This liberal thing is insane, right? They're telling me, like, this uh, little personal story here, my kid, older, when my older kid was four years old, the younger kid was two, the kid, the girl they played with on my block, there's not Muslim, uh, the mom came one day, she says, okay, my daughter is now a boy, and you have to call her this boy's name, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is insane. I mean, she doesn't understand the category that she's saying she is. And you want me to tell my kids this? And I'm sitting there trying to tell them what boys are and what girls are and stuff like that, and who has a penis and who has, doesn't have a penis and all that stuff, and you want me to undermine this because your four-year-old is telling you what gender it is? I told half, half my friends were like, oh, that's crazy. Uh, my, half my friends, not Muslims, were like, that's amazing, that's great. You should embrace that, right? So if you're a young Muslim guy, your reaction is going to be, that's crazy. For most young Muslims, that, that is crazy. And so you, you, just, you just see the, you know, you read the headlines. Flight denies woman emotional support peacock. Remember this? United Airlines wouldn't let like a woman with her emotional support peacock come on the plane. Uh, Dutch guy says he's actually 50 years old and not 70 years old. So you're sitting there, you're a young Muslim guy, you're like, this is insanity. So what's my other option? So this, the, the kind of progressive liberal option is crazy. So where's my other option? Is a conservative one. And the conservative one is also hyperbolically opposed to this one. So it, they end up, you don't go into a moderate sunnah of the prophet approach. You go into this kind of alt-righty, toxic masculinity approach where you make fun of people who have views different, you, different than you. You kind of, you're like, oh, a real man, his woman listens to him. A real man, he don't put up with this. A real man, you know... You know, his woman's going to, he's going to sit there with his boys and eat chicken wings, and his woman's going to bring him pizza slices, and he's going to watch the game. That's what a real man does, right? This is the other, so the problem is, instead, instead of following the, the sunnah of the Prophet, والسلام, their aversion, understandable aversion to this progressive vision of the world, pushes them into a toxic masculinity vision of the world. And that's a big problem. It's a big problem for two reasons. One, that is a nasty way to live. Two, you're going to get divorced. And I'll add another one in there. Three, see all these Muslim women here? See all these women? Guys, look at me. These women, every day, put up with a, a level of oppression and attention that you can't imagine. I say this as a white guy who gets treated, so, but I hear this and I see this. I'm sorry that I don't, I mean, I'm not sorry I don't experience it, but I wish that I could share something with you that would help you relate, but I can't, right? Any of these women, if they take off their hijab tomorrow and they say, I'm not a Muslim anymore, I'm, an, or I'm a progressive, enlightened Muslim, you know, they will be love-bombed. 
They will get Huffington Post columns. They will get grants given to them. They will be welcomed into the bosom of a society that will reward them for realizing that they were oppressed. And if you don't treat these women with respect, and you don't give them every reason to stay part of your world, they are going to be out of there. Because every force in this society is pulling them out. And if you don't show them the utmost compassion, you're contributing to that. I don't... It does, you might even think this, you know, let's say you're talking to a Muslim woman. You might even think this person is totally wrong. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's got everything mixed up. You should still show her compassion because pushing her away is not going to help anybody. Okay. So now let's, I want to actually look at what is the, what is the sunnah of the Prophet? What is the sunnah of the Prophet in terms of dealing with your family? What is the what is the ideal role model that we Muslims have? Who can tell me? Aisha asked, was asked, how was the Prophet with his family? What did she say? Who can tell me? You with the hat on. Yes, you with the hat on. Well, that's actually a correct answer, but not the correct question. He was your walking Quran. Kana fi mihnati ahlihi. Yani a kana fi khidmati ahlihi. He was in the service of his family. The Prophet was not served. The Prophet was at the service of his family. This is a fundamental lesson you have to learn. Real men don't get served. Real men serve others. Real men serve their families. Real men serve their wives. Real men serve their children. Because that's what strong people do. Strong people don't hurt other people. Strong people protect other people. And they protect those that they're responsible for. Uh, who saw the movie Jack Reacher 2 Never Look Back? One person? You guys don't travel enough. So it was really interesting. Tom Cruise movie. I love Tom Cruise. So he's the he, he's talking Jack Reacher. You guys know who this guy is? Action hero. Like all action heroes, he's named Jack. He is talking to this young girl who's like kind of living on the streets, and he asks her how she survives. She says, it's easy. You find a group of guys and you go up to the strongest one and you become friends with him. And Jack Reacher's like, what do you mean you go up to the strongest one? She, she says, the strongest guy always protects you. It's the weak guys who hurt women. It's the weak guys who hurt women. And what does the Prophet says to them? says says, to the men, خيركم, خيركم uh, Ahl means family, but Ahl so oftentimes, especially in Hadith, because Arabs are very sensitive about gender things, means your wives. Best of you is the best of your, to your best of you men is the best of you to your family, the best of you to your wives. And I was having actually it was yesterday, I was having this really interesting discussion with this super engaged young Muslim woman. And she said to me, she says, Give me one example when the Prophet used compulsion or authority or power to tell one of his women folk what to do. I couldn't think of any examples. I actually never thought about this. I don't know, maybe someone else could think of it. I could not think of any examples. The Prophet didn't order people to do things. I mean, sometimes, you know, very simple things, like especially in his capacity as a leader, he would tell, tell people to do things. But his capacity as a husband, and his capacity as a father, very subtle, very subtle. His power and his authority is known. He doesn't have to express it, right? Um, what's really interesting, when you look at especially hadith collections, hadiths of the Prophet of God, you, most of them actually, they, they don't really have sections about like, oh, what are the husband's authority over his wife? You have what are the husband's rights with his wife? What are the rights, wife, uh, rights over her husband? But you also see what are the limits on the husband's authority? And those limits are very clear. The husband cannot com uh, command his wife to do something that's masia, that's disobedient to God. So one example is like what a guy is saying to his wife, I want you to get uh, hair extensions. Well, I mean, in Arabic, right? And uh, the prophet says, you know, you can't command this. This is prohibited. Um, how is the prophet described? According to Aisha, he mended his own clothing. He washed his own clothing. He mended his sandals. He took care of his own needs. And, one, and this is all hadith in Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Muslim Ahmed, you have a hadith that the Prophet, 
was helping his wife, like, cut, they were cutting meat, and so he was holding the meat, and one of them was cutting the meat, right? Um, how is the prophet with his children? What does he say about his children? Altaf already told you something, but he also said, for giving gifts to your children, be just between your children. And how, in another, in another version of the hadith, what does he say? And he read by Ibn Abbas, what is being just between your children? It means being treating them equally. In fact, in one hadith in Sunnah al-Bayhaqi, he says, treat them equally, and in fact, give the female, the girl child more than the male child when you're giving them gifts. And then one hadith in, uh, in uh, one of uh, collections of a Tahawi, this man comes up and he has his, his son comes up and sits on one of his legs and his daughter comes up and sits next to him. And the Prophet says, you should be just with your children. Put the daughter on your other leg, right? So this is the sunnah of the Prophet in, in his family. This is, is this what we would call like uh, the kind of like manly man in the conservative uh, liberal polarization today? And this is where this is sensitive for Muslims. Because a lot of times Muslims, especially if your families come from overseas, your families might come from countries where like, you know, like there is a lot more manly man culture. So not only does that kind of seem attractive in the current American political alignment, but it also seems attractive in that it looks like the quote unquote real Islam that your parents knew before they came here and got deluded. Right? But that's also not, the, the, the sunnah of the prophet is not to be served if you're a man. The sunnah of the prophet is to serve your family. Okay. So I, I want to, I want to, did I do something wrong? really loud because I'm almost done. I was thinking about this uh, as I was writing this. Um, yeah. What, what are the, I mean, if, if you're a Muslim and you're, if you're a Muslim and you're confused, if you're a Muslim and you want to know how you should live, where should you turn? You turn to the Sunnah of the Prophet, the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, right? If you look at the the, the, the Prophet's community, alayhi salatu salam, wa radiyallahu anhum, right? If you look at that community, what are, the, what are the ideal role models for men and for women? Do you understand my question? What are the ideal role models? I think if you think about it, there's actually not that much difference between the ideal Muslim man and the ideal Muslim woman. Of course, they have differences in the, the, like, for example, women don't pray when they're menstruating. Men don't menstruate, at least if they're lucky, right? Uh, women uh, have, wear hijab. Men don't wear hijab, right? There's, there's, I'm not saying men and women are the same right? by any stretch of the imagination. But what I'm saying, if you look at their characteristics, they're actually, I, I don't really know the difference. They're, they're all very confident. They're proud. They're proud of themselves, but immediately humble in the face of the commands of God and the Prophet. When they think they're right, they're committed and brave and courageous and in, in body and in word, but they immediately submit to the commands of God and the Prophet. They're both, uh, I would just say that they're both extremely courageous. Extremely courageous. And you see, they both feel their voices should be heard. So Aisha... Aisha becomes a major political actor in the Muslim community after the death of the Prophet and one of the main teachers of the Prophet Sunnah and the proper understanding of Islam. We all know the story in the Sharh Ma'ani al thought of At-Tahawi that during one of the khutbahs of Omar ibn al-Khattab when he was caliph, a woman stood up in the khutbah and corrected Omar, a point he was making. Did he get upset and say, how dare you talk in the khutbah? No, he said, actually, you're correct. He changed it. He said, yes, you're correct. This is a story that Ibn Kathir considers authentic. And Sharf Ma'anil thought about the Hawi. If you think, I have, a, I have actually have a running collection of female companions who killed people with tent poles. 
for some reason, tent pole was like the weapon of choice for early Muslim women. <laughs> like a tent pole. So if you have, if you're a guy and you have a tent pole in your house, consider moving it. So the, they, Um Fadl, who killed Abu Jahl? No, sorry, Abu Lahab. Who killed Abu Lahab? No, wait. Abu Jahl. Now I'm forgetting. No, Abu Lahab. Who killed Abu Lahab? Abbas's mother. Uh, Ibn Abbas's mother, Um Fadl. She, he was beating one of the, his slaves in Mecca, and the slave was Muslim. And she took a tent pole, smashed him in the head. His wound fell through, he died of it. We know the story of Nusayb ibn Ka'b, the female companion of the Prophet who actually fought in the Battle of Uhud, protected the Prophet against attacks when other people ran away. And then she later died in camp on campaign fighting. And I, I can go on. I love this story. A woman named Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. She's in, during the Battle of the, of the Trench, she's in one of the Muslim fortresses in Medina. And uh, her husband is Hassan bin Thabit, the poet. So there's this guy, one of the enemy soldiers, going around outside the fort, and he's about to find the entrance to get in. So uh, Safiya bin Abdul Muttalib says, you need to go down and deal with this guy. And Hassan's like, oh, I'm not sure about that. She jumps out and kills him. But then look, this is really interesting. She says to her husband, I'm not going to take off his armor and his weapons because he's a man, I'm not going to touch him. So it's really interesting. that th Don't get this idea that because these women were brave and confident and courageous Muslims, that somehow that means that gender doesn't mean anything. No, for both male and female Muslims in the time of the Prophet that division between gender, that notion of sexual propriety was extremely important. You don't touch a man who's not related to you. Remember, the, and this is this isn't this is even this isn't even just the Muslims. When the Muslim, when the the Quraysh came to kill the Prophet in Mecca, then you know the story. They didn't go into the house immediately. Why? They're afraid that there were women folk in there. They would see the women folk. So this is a. This is when we, we when we think about what it means to be a good Muslim, a confident Muslim, a committed Muslim. Don't get confused by the polarization of the society today in the United States. Don't get confused by the polarization of things globally. Turn to the Sunnah of the Prophet. Turn to the Sunnah of the Prophet and offer. This is very important. This is a confused country, people. This is a really confused country in a confused time. If you want to help, offer that model to other people. Offer the model of the Sunnah of the Prophet to other, to other men. Offer the model of the female, of the mothers of believers to, to other women in the society. Jazakum Allah khair.